Greetings once again, fellow financial independence seekers. It's Matt with Trading Your Job. And today I'd like to look at a recent video Graham Stephan put out, and it was about the outcomes of investing in individual stocks over long time periods from 1926 to 2016. In general, if investing in individual stocks had a greater return than just buying T-bills, and the outcome was pretty surprising. So For example, a finance professor at Arizona State University analyzed over 26,000 stocks. I found the ASU professor that Graham's referring to. His name is Hendrik Bessembender, and Hendrik's papers are available for free, and they are quite interesting. So in case you'd like to find them, you just scroll down on his bio, and under research, there's his research website URL, and you just go ahead and click there. It'll take you to the free papers. In regards to this specific research, I found the premise intriguing because I know a lot of people like to pick single stocks and ham and haw over what to add to their portfolio. And this also applies to dividend investors. You know, if you're going to buy a company that's paying you a dividend and you're getting that money 20 years from now and the company doesn't exist anymore, then maybe that's something that you want to consider in your overall planning. And so the outcome of this research could change your position on that as well. Clearly, this is one of his more popular, if not most popular, papers based on the downloads and citations over here. So the hypothesis was, do single stocks that have come into existence since 1926 through 2016, because the paper's from 2018, tend to outperform a risk-free treasury bill? Because why would you take on risk if the answer is no? To summarize some of what he says in the introduction, he says that we know over long time periods, stocks are one of the only asset classes that provide a real return and beat inflation to maintain purchasing power. But when you look at how many single stocks don't make it, it becomes really hard to understand how the index keeps chugging upward and how stocks uh, in aggregate, you know, provide positive real returns when so many do not. So first, how many stocks are we talking about that he's analyzed since 1926? And that number is approximately 25,300. To put that in comparison, the total US stock market currently has 3,883 stocks in it. So Hendrick's looking at what happens to a typical buy and hold investor if you bought from the initial public offering and held it indefinitely until whatever happened to the company happened to the company. The average time that a publicly traded stock lasted from 1926 to 2016 was seven and a half years. So after that seven and a half years, if you owned it, what happened to it? Well, it would get delisted and that would be after bankruptcy and you know going to zero. So you'd, you'd have a negative return on your holdings if you bought if you bought them at the IPO and held the average stock, you know, this is the majority of them that are going to zero. So it really doesn't come as much of a surprise when you think about that, then that the most common return of any single stock from 1926 to 2016 is zero. Or if you prefer to think about it as negative 100%, that's another way to think about it. Is the research saying that you can't make any money in the stock while it's publicly traded? No, it's not saying that. It's just saying that if you were a buy and hold investor, if you were trying to leave this money to later generations, if you were having it for your retirement, that it might not be there at the end, and that's for the majority of, of single stocks. And so the question then is, how do markets continue to move upward if the majority of stocks are going to zero? And that's the beauty of an index. As some stocks die, a strong few continue the index trajectory upward. So even though in an index you are buying all of the losers, it also owns the big winners, and you don't have to figure out what those big winners are going to be in advance. They just naturally find their way to the top of the index become, because they become the biggest by market capitalization. So you don't have to do any research. It just automatically finds its way to the top of the index. And then if you own the index, you own the biggest winners. And that's how the total return has been positive is that, you know, returns are usually concentrated in a few companies that are overperforming. So it really makes you stop and think because 4% of stocks that have ever come into existence between this time period are responsible for the entire net gain of the U.S. stock market since 1926. So when you think about long-term wealth creation and how you should employ it in your own portfolio, if you're intending to leave money to future generations, should you even consider anything other than an index fund? 
And we're seeing the same thing today. There are a small amount of companies called the Magnificent Seven by some. Uh, there's a few others that get included for other people's lists, but they're responsible for the outsized performance. If you looked back 10 to 20 years, were any of these companies the ones that were responsible for the performance? No. And if you look ahead 10 to 20 years, will these same companies be the ones responsible for the performance? Hard to say, but likely no. And so if you compare past holdings of the index to current, uh, many of the names don't exist. What this really does mean is over long time periods, it's very difficult for us and for mutual fund managers or ETF managers uh, to pick stocks that will last for long time periods. So when we were thinking of where to put most of our money for long time periods, especially retirement accounts, then it seems that the greatest chance of success is by putting the majority of our money in index funds. It's the only thing that's really been proven to increase our purchasing power over time, you know, to inflation. It seems to become a clear winner with the majority of our money. Now that's not to say that we can't do other strategies and then put those profits into index funds. You know, part of this channel is getting to financial independence more quickly than traditional methods and traditional methods would definitely be indexing. But with the accounts that are designed for that, such as your health savings account or your retirement account, that's really what we should be doing and putting as much money as we can in there. And as a safeguard, most retirement plans and workplace plans do this anyway. They, they're not going to allow us to buy individual stocks. They're going to be pretty limited in terms of how much trading you can do. They're trying to protect us from ourselves because they do show that over time, you know, the, the biggest thing you can do is kind of set it and forget it. There should definitely be some accounts that you're doing that with. You shouldn't trade with your entire account because there will be things that happen that we cannot predict. As much as we like to chart and do fundamental analysis and all those things, they are not absolutely what's going to happen. So even if we do have skill in other investment styles or trading, it's important that with most of our money, we're doing the tried and true method of getting wealthy over long periods of time. So make sure you're picking a smart allocation of low cost index funds and saving a high percentage of your income and not touching it for decades with at least some of your money. If your trading or investing style doesn't seem to work out, you wanna make sure that there's something that you're doing that does. I'd like to hear if you were surprised by this research or if you knew all of this already and if it changes how you think about where you're putting your next dollars. If you have any questions or comments or concerns, please leave them below. As always, thanks for watching. Till next time.